Allora, cari amici, signore e signori, vi prego di prendere posto perché siamo in streaming, quindi dobbiamo iniziare puntualmente. Buongiorno a tutti, ringrazio tutti per essere intervenuti e adesso è il momento che il, il convegno è in inglese e anche per cortesia nei confronti del professor Young proseguo con un breve saluto eh, in, in inglese. Uh, I am very pleased to host here at the Accademia delle Scienze di Torino the inaugural event which was organized by Professor Di Cunto and by the Department of Neurosciences, Neurosciences of the University of Turin, the department which is entitled to Rita Levi Montalcini. I thank them very much for the precious work they have done and uh, I thank as well Professor Vercelli and Professor Piazza. Professor Piazza is late, uh, he had problems with the taxes. Um, Professor Vercelli and Professor Piazza, uh, who gave uh, their willingness uh, to deliver introductory speeches, introductory reports. I'm very happy, I said, for three reasons. The first one is that the Academia delle Scienze and I have the pleasure and honor of hosting Professor Michael Warren Young, an internationally renowned geneticist and uh, biologist, and as you know, a Nobel Prize for uh, physiology and medicine, uh, uh, 2017 Nobel Prize. The figure of uh, Professor Young will be introduced, will be pre presented later by uh, Professor Di Cunto, who has the knowledge, the, the skills to do this. Well, the skills that uh, I do not have. But I wish to start our works by giving immediately our warmest greeting to Professor Young hmm? on behalf of the Academia delle Scienze di Torino and personally. I thank you deeply, Mr. Young, for your participation at this meeting. The second reason is that this event is ideally placed in continuity with a conference, the Academia delle Scienze, organized two years ago, two years ago, if I, I'm not mistaken, to uh, celebrate Giuseppe Levi. The conference was divided into two parts. The first one was dedicated to Levi's uh, scientific work, scientific activity, and the second one to his school, uh, and particularly to the three pupil, pupils of him uh, who were awarded the Nobel prize for medicine, and among them was also Rita Levi Montalcini. So, uh, Levi's importance lies not only in the contribution, the paramount contribution he made to the development of science, but also in the commitment he put into the training of young scientists. For this reason, I think it was very appropriate to give his name to the school, to the talent school we are inaugurating today. So I have arrived at the third reason of my satisfaction. All of us scientists, as you, and humanists, like me, 
are concerned about the development of science and culture. And so we are primarily concerned that governments and institutions provide adequate, or at least sufficient, funding and facilities for research. But we are equally concerned about the difficulty, about the difficulty with which young people can be recruited for this venture, so that new talents do not go to waste. But we know that in this case, it's not just a question of money, of investments and structures, but above all, of person, person, personal engagement, personal engagement, personal commitment to develop a dialogue, a correct, a, 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 fr a fruitful dialogue between the generations. Therefore, the idea of a talent school inspired by Giuseppe Levi seems to me a sign that for once, at least for once, the right path has been taken. And if I may add a, a bitter note to these greetings, in the dramatic international situation we are living in these weeks, where history seems have gone back 80 years, this is small, it's very small, but a signif significant consolation. Thank you. Uh, I don't steal any more time from the conference and I give at once the floor to the second spe the speaker, uh, the rector of the University of Turin, Professor Geuna, Professor Stefano Geuna. Stefano, grazie. Thank you very much, Massimo. So, first of all, thank you very much to you and to Academia delle Scienze for hosting this very important event in such a nice and impressive uh, room, even if I know it very well every time entering here, you can really perceive the, the importance and the history and, and which is the, also the future of science. And uh, as representative of uh, the University of Torino, I welcome everyone, but especially Professor Young. I'm uh, really very, very happy that you accepted the invitation of my colleague at the Department of Neuroscience and all our communities uh, looking forward for your presentation very, very, with a lot, lot of interest and we are very excited about that. And uh, of course, the event is also very uh, representative of, uh, of a particular uh, feature of our university the, and, and a particular person, a professor who uh, was uh, an eminent professor at our university in the last century uh, and uh, who created uh, uh, a long-term and very rich school of scientists that, uh, as uh, Massimo already anticipated, uh, gave rise to uh, three, three of his pupils were Nobel laureates and many more have been uh, occupying different position of very prestigious position in Italian and uh, uh, worldwide university. So uh, connecting this lecture to the growth of this new Giuseppe Levi Talent School, it's really a way, as I was saying before, to, to connect the past with the future, because we know that uh, looking to the past is not only a matter of uh, of knowing what's what's happened in the in the last uh, years, centuries, and and so on, but it's also a matter of building up a better future. So, uh, building up a better future in every sense. Uh, we know that we are facing a tremendous uh, international crisis, various crises uh, at international level, and and we all want to do something. I think that everyone can do the best we can do is to do best the best as we can our job, everyday job, because we cannot solve directly probably the 
crisis, the war crisis or other crises, but if we do in the best way we can our everyday job, I think this is the good way to build up uh, the future. And, and therefore we are a university, we, we are an academia, and we want to, to build up a future where uh, science will continue to grow up. And science grows up continuously based mainly on the young people because this is the future. So the idea of this meeting is very much uh, devoted and dedicated to the young scientists. Some of them are in this room. Of course, the room is little and not everyone can attend the conferences. Much more, many more are attending online using these new ways we can communicate that we learn during the uh, pandemic that really I'm sure will, will be a a very, an exceptional stimulus for our young people. And, and finally, also, of course, for me, not only as representative of the old university, but also as representative of the neuroscience community. And uh, I have also the chance to work in the building <laughs> where Giuseppe Levi was working many years before me. But so I, I knew that that environment directly. I have the chance to know many of these uh, pupils of him uh, and, and therefore it's a special pleasure to, to be here and again to welcome everyone to this uh, exceptional event uh, and I'm sure everyone will take so much advantage of it. Thank you very much. Grazie, grazie molte Stefano. And now is the turn of Professor Alessandro Mauro, director of the Department of Neurosciences. Thank you, Professor Mori. Uh, I want to repeat uh, welcome everyone for uh, for the participation to this morning uh, hosted in uh, the beautiful Academy of Science of Turin. Uh, first of all, I would like. Uh, uh, thank you on behalf of myself uh, and of the uh, Department of Neuroscience of uh, University of Turin, uh, because this event uh, is considered by us very important for different reasons. Uh, in fact, today we open uh, the talent school uh, named after Giuseppe Levi, uh, and this talent school represents the logical continuation for us uh, of educational initiatives that we included in the project uh, called uh, Department of Excellence, il Dipartimento di Eccellenza, which has seen our department engage in uh, the last uh, five years. Uh, the links between our department uh, of neuroscience and the prestigious anatomical school of Turin is uh, very close and almost obvious given that our department is named after uh, Rita Levi Montalcini, who, who had her first mentor in Giuseppe Levi. Moreover, let me say that among uh, the aims of a Giuseppe Levi Talent School, uh, one is clearly consistent with uh, this moment of uh, significant uh, structural renewal for the University of Turin. Uh, the desire to repopulate of young students and researchers, restoring its life and cultural centrality. Uh, the anatomical institutes that hosted the studies of Giuseppe Levi, Salvador Luria, uh, Renato Dulbeco, Rita Levi, Montalcini, among many others. I won't stop here, but before leaving you, to, works, uh, to the works of this morning. Let me thank uh, Professor Michael Young, who accepted our invitation to come to Turin, offering us the opportunity to listen his inaugural lecture. But let me also thank uh, the other speakers, Alberto Piazza, Alessandro Vercelli, and in particular, my friend, uh, Ferdinando Di Cunto, that I consider the creator of the Giuseppe Levi Talent School and uh, that who will be the main architect of uh, its realization. Good morning. Adesso un piccolo break per un cambiamento di scena. Eh, cambiano gli attori. Invito eh, il professor Piazza ad assumere la presidenza e quindi venire al tavolo. 
insieme al professor Vercelli per la seconda fase del workshop. Grazie. Good morning to everybody. Um, I'm sorry I was a little late, but the strike by the taxi was really didn't allow me to be exactly on time. I hope to, I'm, to, to be very happy to be here and uh, I'd like to introduce in some way this very stimulating uh, speak about Giuseppe Levi, his scholars and the dynamic horizon of biology that is a very imp important frame of work that uh, I'd like to elucidate in short. The story of the three Nobel Prize winning student of Giuseppe Levi, clearly, Luria Dulbecco and Levi Montalcini, who gets a very different aspect of the relationships which links the success of scientific discovery by a researcher with the years of education, and the mentor played a central role. I mean, Giuseppe Levi because uh, about uh, transmitting his student, let's say three very important points, how to keep disciplinary and moral rigor high and inseparable link it, how to set up an experiment correctly, second, and how to write, also is important today, it's very important, scientific publications and how to alternate severity and encouragement in opinion of the students. With respect to the most of the uh, United States and American colleagues, including the founding factors of molecular biology, who came from a background in physics or biology, I came to have really a background in physics also, the three students had a medical background, therefore less rigorous but more organic in approaching biological problems, even to Lurie and Dulbeck made up for his short in by devoting the postgraduate years to study physics. On the other hand, the role of the network of relations with colleagues and institutions, and this is an important factor in an international context that Levy enjoyed uh, as being often neglected, I, I mean, I think. His relationship with Rossetti, Hamburger, and the Rockefeller Foundation were central in this sense. The fact that Levy, Luria, Levy Montalcini, and other members of the Turing Laboratory belong to the Jewish minority is also to be ascribed to his local dimension. In the difficult years of the restrictions of the rights inflicted by fascism, they had in common anti-fascist feelings and courageous eagerness for the human and work adventure capable of transforming constraints into professional opportunity. I think this is very important, thank you. Today, today, if however these uh, local stories succeed in going hand in hand with the major political institutional events of those years, it is due to Salvatore Luria to represent a synthesis in some way of two Italian schools, set of Levi in theory, and since the atomic physics founded by Fermi in Rome. Thanks to Levi and Fano, he came into contact with Rossetti, who introduced him to radiogenetics and the writer of Delbruck after the two years in Paris, moving to the user where a few, a few years, thanks to the foundation of the so-called Phage School and the discovery of the structure of DNA by student Watson, he became one of the founding fathers of molecular biology. And it was in the K decade between 37, 1937 and 1947 
Seth Luria led the foundations of molecular biology through bacteria genetics. In the agreement between local history and general history, change also inevitably played the central role. I've shown what the various changes, of course, of local students who casually directed their research into the current race, as well, important also, as the serendipity, today this word is used, uh, and this serendipity uh, in, uh, in a way, uh, the agreement between local history and general history, and this is a very, a very important point, as shown by the various changes, of course, by the students who casually directed the research into the correct rails, as well as the serendipity with which some of the K discoveries came about. Luria discovered the phage, the experimental object on which he built up his career, thanks to a chance encounter on a tram, just as the intuitive the experiment which has was to give him the Nobel Prize by serving, he say, a slot machine during an academic celebration. This is a very interesting fact. fact. Uh, Dulbeko uh, approached radiogenetics by casually pointing out the radium needle on the gonads of the cheek instead of the all anatomical starch. While Levi Montalcini used the coloring technique which was to highlight some specific ganglions, macro and micro history, biographic and institutional interconnections in the diaspora to approach biology within a more dynamic frame as the title of this conference is still. At different time and in different disciplines, the three Nobel laureate students of Giuseppe Levi were able to intuit the importance of the molecular explanation in the own disciplinary field. Luria and Dulbecco in the genetic one, and Levi Montalcini in the neuroscientific one, tracing back their discoveries with the bacterial genetics, oncological virology, or nitrophobic factors, to the most productive and successful scientific paradigm of their time. Of the many important contributions that Giuseppe Levi has made to our knowledge of the normal anatomy of the nerve source, there is probably none more valuable than the clear and precise description that he is as given of the structure of the nucleus. Previous to his talking the matter up, the study of this portion of the nerve cell had been comparatively neglected, and all descriptions that had been given of it were more or less inaccurate and sexually incomplete. The publication of his first paper on the subject in 1896 may justly be said to mark one of the more important steps in the history of the progress of our knowledge in the nerve cell anatomy. And in conclusion of this short description, this short introduction, let me report a score, short sketch of his great-grandchild, Carlo Ginzburg. During my childhood, he influenced my perception of science as an adventurous journey. He always focused my attention on his passion as well as his respect for data. This today is very important to point it out. Typical of a scientist who was still deeply indebted to the positivist legacy. This was an attitude foreign of any form of naivety, and it remains for me and for everybody to still valid today. 
last slide. I would like, yes. If you see it, another aspect of, uh, not, not scientific, not really scientific, okay. Uh, maybe I see it a little bit, and it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, okay, I would like to point out that uh, in our Academy of Science, we are publishing a, 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 a book, it's not a book, a report of a conference we took many years ago, which is called Giuseppe Levi, Maestro, Maestri of Nobel and scientists. But I would like to conclude with uh, pointing out the uh, uh, importance of his wife. His wife is represented in this slide. Is uh, <coughs> Lydia Levy Tanzit, Lydia Tanzit, that it was very important for not only for his education, but also for uh, his uh, effects for a very of human point. And let's check this in the next slide. Where is uh, uh, grave of Torino? Lydia Tanzi and Giuseppe Levi are buried together. And what we read, this is not so clear, but also I, I would like to point out, uh, if probably it's the next one. Yes, it's the next one. Uh, I, I like in Italian first and in English. Lydia Levi Tanzi visse serenamente, confortata dal vivo affetto del compagno della sua vita, U.S. Wall, dei figli, dei nipoti, dalla simpatia degli amici. And after it's a date of when he's born and, and he's died. And after that, it's written, Giuseppe Levi, biologo, maestro di vita e di pensiero, Deposero i figli, i nipoti, gli allievi. In English, the first one might be his right, and non English, I don't know. No, no let's say. Uh, Lydia Levi Tansi lived serenely, supported by the great love of their alive companion, who was Giuseppe Levi. Uh, her children and grandchildren and her friends' affection. The age of the affection was very important in pointing out it is very meaningful. Uh, and a few words about him. Giuseppe Levi, biologist. This is important to point out for what is the title of our conference today. I'm very happy that this conference is uh, given here. And uh, Giuseppe Levi, biologist, master of life and of thoughts, laid by children, grandchildren, and students. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. And thank you, Professor Mori and Professor Piazza, for uh, having hosted uh, this uh, beautiful event. Uh, and thank you, Ferdinando Di, Con Di Cunto, for organizing this and uh, having uh, had uh, the idea of, uh, of the Talent School and uh, uh, to to Professor Young for coming here and to to be the the first uh, honored speaker of uh, of the Talent School. Uh, I will just tell a few words about uh, Giuseppe Levi as an anatomist. Uh, 
Professor Levy was born in Trieste uh, from uh, a Jewish uh, banker family. And uh, uh, after the death uh, of his father, uh, moved uh, with, uh, with the mother to, the, uh, to Florence, where he started to uh, attend the Institute of Pathology with Alessandro Lusti and the uh, psychiatric clinic Asilum San Salvi with Eugenio Tanzi and Ernesto Lugaro. So he, uh, after graduation, uh, he... Uh, was assistant over there in the clinic of uh, nervous and mental diseases directed by Eugenio Tanzi. But uh, actually he had uh, uh, no interest in the clinic uh, and uh, he moved uh, for one year in Berlin uh, uh, to, to study with uh, Herthwick, a biologist. And then uh, he moved back uh, in Florence uh, where uh, he became assistant at the Institute of Anatomy with uh, Chiarugi, a famous anatomist over there at that time. Uh, he also uh, had the position at the zoological station in Naples. And then uh, finally, he became uh, a full professor of anatomy in uh, Sassari in 1910. Uh, actually, there is the story that uh, he uh, did the, the national competition for becoming full professor, but uh, he was uh, not uh, selected for the uh, most important places in, uh, in Italy because uh, he was not considered a classical anatomist because uh, he did not like uh, macroscopical anatomy. He was uh, actually, in fact, he was a neurobiologist, not really a classical uh, anatomist. And then uh, uh, he went uh, a full professor in Palermo uh, who was a volunteer in, in the First uh, World War and where he acted as a medical officer. And then uh, finally he uh, moved uh, in uh, 1919 uh, at the University of Torino. At the time, uh, the university uh, uh, was uh, uh, populated mainly by uh, lecturers, uh, actually, uh, at the Faculty of Medicine, at the time there were 17 full professors, and I think I think that the rector would have uh, really appreciated that this uh, uh, small number of people in the faculty in order to to agree uh, simply and uh, take decision without uh, making too many agreements uh, with uh, too many people. And uh, there were uh, many famous uh, researchers in. Uh, uh, different uh, uh, subjects, and uh, some of them uh, are uh, very, very famous uh, uh, around the world, and especially uh, we, we want to remember, uh, uh, for example, uh, Mario Carrara, who was uh, very famous uh, also because one, he was one of the few, very few uh, um, professors who uh, uh, refused to sign uh, the uh, agreement for the uh, uh, fascist uh, uh, government and to 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 agree the, to, to to sign uh, fidelity to the uh, fascism. Uh, at the time, there were very few women in the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, one of them uh, was uh, Rita Levi Montalcini, who became uh, uh, one of the uh, um, pupils of, uh, of Giuseppe Levi. And uh, I want also to, uh, to show that uh, uh, many students there at the medical school were foreigners. There were agreements, especially with the Great Britain, for uh, having medical students here. And this is something that uh, finally we succeeded uh, to, to start again this collaboration, uh, international collaboration with the medical school uh, in English uh, here in Torino. And uh, it's, uh, it's very nice uh, to have uh, these uh, exchanges uh, with other cultures and uh, languages. Uh, the Institute of Anatomy uh, that you see here uh, is uh, a, a building which was uh, built uh, uh, in 1898 and uh, he, uh, it, it is uh, here, there is a, a, a picture of the, of the Institute and uh, as the director told, it will be soon uh, renewed and uh, uh, the 
uh, there will be a, a, a large part uh, devoted to the museums. So I uh, want to remember the Museum of Anatomy, but also the uh, Museum Cesare Lombroso, which is uh, very nice. And uh, going back to the story of uh, Giuseppe Levi, uh, he, uh, uh, he had uh, many students, as I told you, but uh, in 1938, uh, he was uh, obliged uh, to leave uh, the, uh, the teaching because of the Russian laws. He was deprived uh, of his professorship and uh, went uh, abroad for a certain period of time in uh, Belgium. Uh, to, uh, to make experiments over there. But then he was uh, uh, obliged uh, to, to come back because, of course, Belgium was uh, uh, conquered by the uh, uh, Germany, by Germany. Uh, when uh, the, the war ended, uh, he uh, uh, went back to his position in teaching and uh, uh, in the 1947, uh, the National Research Council entrusted him uh, with the direction of the study center on the growth and senescence of organisms. So here you see the Institute of Anatomy, which is uh, uh, very similar now, and uh, it's uh, very peculiar, the fact that uh, many things uh, remained uh, as uh, they were. This is the dissection room. And uh, uh, here you have the Anatomy Museum, uh, which, na which is now named from Luigi Rolando. And then uh, there are the labs uh, in, uh, on the right. Of course, uh, now we don't have any more labs because uh, we, uh, we don't have uh, the, uh, um, you know, the, the possibility to work uh, in that building uh, uh, with the novel uh, uh, instruments and so on. So uh, the character of uh, Giuseppe Levi was uh, uh, very severe, and it was uh, you, uh, many people say that uh, he, he had a sudden outburst of anger. And uh, uh, what is very peculiar is that, uh, according to many of his students, even though there were no uh, judgments at the end of the year, how. Uh, we have now with the uh, quotation uh, of the professors by the students, but in any case, it was considered boring. And this was uh, probably because uh, he, did, he disliked uh, the uh, description of macroscopical anatomy. Uh, so there were very jokes made by the uh, students, and uh, he was uh, upset for that. But in any case, he was uh, deeply respected because uh, uh, he was uh, clearly against uh, the regime and also for uh, his uh, uh, high reputation as a scientist. And uh, that was uh, testified by the fact that uh, every year at the San Giuseppe Day, uh, the students place a bouquet of flowers on the desk of, uh, of his chair. And this is uh, the... Uh, the room where uh, he made the, the lessons, which is uh, uh, until now it's uh, more or less the same. So, uh, he, uh, uh, Renato Dulbecco, one of uh, his uh, uh, students who got uh, the Nobel Prize, uh, uh, was, uh, was saying about him uh, that uh, uh, he understood the students and forgave their uh, antiques, but did not tolerate things that he considered improper. Then he, he railed, spurting up right and left. His lectures were the most popular in the faculty, not because uh, much was learned there. We learned anatomy by studying in books and doing dissections on cold white marble tables or practices, uh, uh, practices microscopic anatomy in the vast laboratory downstairs. The students went uh, to hear Levy because they respected him, they loved him. He was also a symbol of resistance to fascism, even if uh, he contained himself within limits that the regime could tolerate. So uh, one characteristic of his uh, work and of his science uh, was uh, the, uh, the novelty of his uh, techniques. Uh, even though uh, new anatomy at, them, at the times was uh, uh, 
using silver impregnations, and of course he was uh, working with the silver stainings and so on. Uh, his uh, major uh, uh, technique uh, was uh, the one of cell cultures, which started already in uh, Palermo, and then they brought uh, to Torino. And uh, he was uh, really one of the pioneers in, uh, uh, in uh, using cell cultures in the study of, uh, of biology. And then uh, he did uh, micro cinematography, and then uh, he was uh, doing uh, nice experiments. For example, he was uh, doing experiments in vitro uh, to study regeneration, cutting the axons uh, directly in vitro. And uh, another thing was that uh, he was obsessed uh, with the precision, so counting and measuring everything. And in the books of uh, Rita Levi Montalcini, you can find uh, some reports about them, uh, about this, because uh, uh, she disliked all these uh, kind of measures, but they are very important. And as you know, uh, we are now counting everything, especially in the morphological sciences and measuring and so on. Uh, his uh, uh, famous book of histology was uh, uh, very updated. And uh, the, in the last uh, uh, version of the book, there was uh, the description also of electron microscopy and histochemistry. So he really liked every new kind of techniques uh, and uh, uh, he had uh, students and uh, pupils doing this kind of new techniques. So here you have uh, on the right uh, his uh, culture chamber in which uh, I worked when I was a, a student at the first years of, uh, of medicine. And we still uh, used uh, his methods uh, to do cell cultures. And uh, uh, another important thing is that uh, he was uh, uh, studying morphology and giving a very big uh, relevance to morphology, but uh, he was actually uh, very, very uh, attentive to the uh, functional aspects of morphology. So it was, he was uh, joining to the either uh, morphology and, uh, and function. And also anatomy for him uh, was not only the description of uh, the structures, but uh, the functional anatomy also the, to, to give uh, a significance to what the students were, uh, were studying. Uh, he, uh, um, he was uh, studying very aspects, uh, a lot of aspects of uh, neurobiology, but not only neurobiology. And uh, um, he did uh, a lot of work, uh, but uh, he didn't do any major uh, breakthrough uh, uh, discoveries during his, uh, his studies. Uh, he, he was, uh, in any case, uh, a, a great, uh, talent scout, uh, and uh, he was uh, 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 was uh, actually uh, growing a, a lot of students uh, in his uh, labs. He was a um, great mentor. He was uh, really looking at the work of his students uh, every day and commenting uh, in a very severe manner. Rita Levi Montalcini is. Uh, telling in his books uh, that the first time uh, she spoke about a nerve growth factor uh, in, uh, uh, in a meeting, uh, uh, she, he was uh, very, very uh, critic uh, against uh, her discoveries. And this was useful, actually, because uh, uh, it's important as a mentor to be critic to the students in order to help them uh, to strengthen uh, their ideas. So the, he had uh, the three Nobel laureates, uh, which uh, I don't, I will not speak about because uh, they were already mentioned by Professor Piazza, but there was also Erta Mayer, which, who was uh, his technician. And then uh, she moved, uh, moved uh, in Rio de Janeiro, where uh, uh, she, uh, she hosted Rita Levin Montalcini for a certain period of time at the 
when uh, she was uh, doing the experiments for the nerve growth factor. And actually, we are in contact with these uh, students of uh, Hertha Mayer. We want to, we are planning to do an event, an online event, uh, to, to join uh, the two schools of Torino and uh, Rio de Janeiro. And then uh, there were many, many uh, students here in Italy, Rodolfo Prino, for example, who was one of his uh, favorite uh, uh, pupils uh, and uh, who went uh, professor in, uh, in Bari, Tullio Terni, uh, and then uh, Luigi Bucciante, uh, Mario Olivo, uh, Giovanni Godina, who was uh, uh, in the School of uh, Veterinary here in Torino, Angelo Barati, who went to Milan, and uh, Guido Filogamo, who was uh, uh, his last student here in Torino and many others in any case, because it, it was really the, his lab and his uh, institute were uh, really a melting pot uh, of uh, many experiences, uh, many students, uh, and uh, uh, myself, uh, even though uh, I, I came uh, to the Institute of Anatomy many, many years after. I went there because uh, a colleague of mine told me that uh, all the best uh, student uh, in Torino should have uh, uh, spent uh, some months at least uh, in the Institute of Anatomy. So his, uh, uh, his story uh, was uh, continued uh, through, through the decades uh, after him. And here are uh, one of his, uh, uh, some of his uh, students, you see on the left, uh, uh, Professor uh, Amprino, in the middle there is Professor Levy, and on, on the right uh, you see Professor Godina. And uh, uh, here you see what uh, he was saying about uh, his students coming to work uh, in, the, in the institute. A certain number of students, usually 20 to, uh, to 25, are chosen from uh, among those uh, who seem to be the best fitted for laboratory research and admitted as uh, intern students. They must have their own microscope and microtome knives. All other instruments are furnished by the institute. The students are chosen among the second year students and occasionally from uh, first year students. Very often they continue to study at the institute until they obtain their degrees. If they are able to do some original interesting research, they present the results if uh, this work is a dissertation for their degrees. Uh, I will not go farther in reading this, uh, this thing, but uh, this is really important. And what is also important is, uh, which is said also by Luia in one of his book, is that uh, Professor Levy really helped uh, the students uh, and the assistants uh, to, to make their work, but uh, he didn't want to put the, his name on their work. So he was very strict. Uh, uh, if uh, he had not uh, collaborated with them in doing the work, he didn't want to put the name. And this is something which uh, uh, was a, a tradition who, who was passed uh, through the professors because uh, uh, also my professor, I have a very few uh, papers in common with my professor with the Philogamo and uh, also uh, my students they know that uh, if I did uh, I do not uh, collaborate with them uh, I will not uh, have the, the name on their papers and this is uh, I think important it was uh, something that we read in many uh, good practice uh, 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 you know, uh, rules of the university, but usually these uh, these are uh, disregarded by many colleagues over there. Um, so uh, I uh, I just uh, want uh, to finish uh, saying that uh, it's uh, uh, it's. Um, the tradition continues, and uh, uh, we are. Uh, talking about the past, but uh, with a look to, to the future. And I'm very happy that uh, the Institute now is uh, uh, enrolled in, 
is uh, it's building and in the department of neuroscience uh, uh, neurobiologists like Ferdinando di Cunto and then uh, we have uh, some uh, 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 neurobioinformaticians like uh, Paolo Provero and uh, uh, Fabrizio P Pizzagalli. So we are trying to, to recreate uh, this uh, uh, melting pot uh, in which uh, the, the new students uh, which will attend the Italian school uh, may grow and find some uh, uh, fertilizer you know, to their uh, brains uh, uh, for, for a better science uh, in Turin. Okay, thank you. Well, what I was asking if you have some questions to put or go directly to the presentation of uh, Ferdinando di Cunto about the Giuseppe Levi Talent School. We are a little late, so I would prefer perhaps to pass to the presentation by Ferdinando di Cunto, but if you have something to ask, uh, please, which is relevant for our presentation. For, yes, one alternative is really to have a dis general discussion after the presentation of uh, Giuseppe Levi Talent School and the inaugural lecture, which are very nice and very, I think, very stimulating. So we are very stimulating presentations that we like discuss. So, Ferdinando uh, Di Cunto came here and probably you have slides. Uh, Good morning to everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, uh, being here. Um, uh, okay, I will uh, do my thanks uh, uh, at the end of the presentation, but uh, uh, I'm uh, very grateful to Professor Young for accepting uh, our uh, invitation. It's my turn to tell uh, something about uh, 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 what the, uh, the Giuseppe Levi Talent School uh, uh, is, but especially uh, what the talent school uh, uh, would like to become in the future. And first of all, uh, a few words about uh, where and when everything started. And uh, I'm particularly grateful to the um, Academy of Sciences because uh, uh, actually uh, the idea started in this room almost three years ago when uh, uh, Professor Piazza organized uh, uh, this uh, uh, beautiful meeting on uh, uh, Giuseppe uh, Levi as uh, uh, teacher of Nobel uh, uh, scientist and uh, uh, anti-fascist. Uh, and uh, uh, since uh, um, I moved uh, not a long time ago in the Institute uh, of uh, Anatomy, in the Department of uh, um, Neuroscience, uh, for the first time, uh, I really uh, realized the uh, how lucky I was because uh, um, I'm a neuroscientist and uh, in that institute, Rita Levi Montalcini started to work uh, together with uh, uh, Giuseppe Levi, uh, providing uh, some fundamental contribution to the neuroscience uh, and uh, especially to the dynamic vision of neuroscience, the functional vision of uh, uh, neuroscience. Then I'm a molecular biologist and uh, uh, one of the uh, students was uh, Luria, actually with the Delbruck, uh, the father of uh, uh, molecular biologist. And uh, uh, what uh, I find uh, uh, amazing is that uh, uh, a few um, meters uh, from uh, uh, the institute, there is the Institute of Physics where Luria started to uh, get involved in uh, um, radiobiology uh, in, in, in uh, um, well, physics and uh, thinking to uh, the beginning of radiobiologists. 
Then uh, I practice uh, a little genomics uh, and transcriptomics, uh, and Renato Dulbecco uh, started uh, to work there. And uh, as you all know, the first uh, uh, very idea of sequencing the human genome uh, and uh, um, for uh, obtaining a view of all transcripts and studying all them together was from a seminal paper from uh, uh, Dulbecco in, uh, uh, in, in uh, science. So this, uh, for the first time, I realized that how inspiring it was uh, and uh, could th this uh, environment uh, uh, could be uh, and uh, how uh, lucky I uh, was. And the uh, uh, next question was uh, uh, if uh, uh, we could make something to, uh, to better keep and make uh, alive this uh, this heritage uh, and uh, the natural answer was that uh, uh, if this uh, can be done it can be done through students uh, because uh, uh, okay you um, uh, professor Vercelli already uh, read this uh, statement uh, by levy but uh, uh, what uh, i um, find uh, in this statement, uh, uh, there is the the uh, the, the, kern, the the fundamental uh, uh, core of the uh, idea. Uh, the best way to revive this would be to have uh, a small group of students, not too big. Uh, the sites uh, of uh, uh, Levy uh, could be good in the uh, original uh, spaces. Uh, and uh, um, uh, chosen very early in uh, uh, in their careers uh, because uh, this was uh, uh, another important thing uh, in order to uh, help them uh, uh, growing uh, since the beginning of uh, their uh, scientific training uh, to present and uh, to include their work as a dissertation for their degrees. So. This was uh, uh, my uh, idea, and uh, uh, to, to make it concrete, uh, I start talking with uh, my colleagues in other uh, uh, course of uh, uh, studies, uh, and uh, uh, we realized that in the last few years we have made a, a great effort, and I think uh, different uh, courses in uh, uh, Torino have uh, strongly improved. Many are in English now, uh, many courses uh, in uh, uh, in uh, uh, biology. Uh, so we have uh, uh, a high ground to move, but the idea was to uh, build on uh, uh, what we have done in uh, uh, these uh, uh, years, uh, something more for uh, um, a selected group of students uh, with uh, a focus on uh, a particular topic, which is uh, uh, very important today, is biological complexity. And, um, you know, uh, biology uh, in uh, uh, the last few years, after the sequencing of the human gen genome, has undergone an enormous transformation. And uh, uh, this transformation has been driven by high throughput approaches um, uh, that that has uh, resulted in an enormous amount of data that uh, need to get uh, integrated in order to, to get sense. Uh, biology has become very good at describing uh, uh, and uh, at describing phenomena at a molecular level, but also at the other levels. So uh, all this technology uh, is very helpful if uh, it can be uh, put together, but to put all this together in a, a sensible way, uh, you really need people capable of uh, grasping not only uh, the um, uh, advanced knowledge in their field, but also to work across fields. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, essentially the, uh, uh, the idea, or at least uh, uh, two of the, uh, lau the Nobel laureates coming from uh, uh, Levy School because uh, both Dulbecco and Luria uh, became strongly involved in physics and was uh, from this contamination that uh, uh, molecular biology and uh, uh, genome uh, sequencing uh, uh, emerged. Uh, but putting all this together is not very simple and uh, as soon as you do, uh, the better it is uh, for, uh, uh, for students because uh, uh, it's better uh, uh, if uh, uh, they uh, help uh, if they learn to uh, put things together very early in their uh, career. Um, 
obviously we uh, are not uh, um, uh, thinking to all the students uh, we think that uh, in the courses they find already decent path but uh, we are looking for uh, particular group of students. We are looking for students uh, who wants and uh, are capable and uh, have uh, special interest to think uh, out of the box and uh, uh, also to be a little uh, uh, crazy sometimes, but in an environment uh, that uh, can uh, have uh, a strong scientific uh, foundation. Uh, so this is uh, our uh, idea to uh, start uh, recruiting uh, uh, students uh, and what can we offer? Uh, we don't ask them to, to carry their uh, microscope and uh, uh, blades and uh, um, we, we can, uh, uh, can uh, offer uh, uh, space and the space is uh, uh, the original space uh, where, uh, uh, where Levy and uh, uh, his students were uh, leaving uh, the, the old day. And uh, um, we can offer also uh, high technology, um, high technology tools uh, such as uh, this or uh, uh, high technology support for uh, uh, the uh, activities. Uh, uh, but uh, what uh, we especially would like to offer is uh, a nice interaction and uh, a, a lot of possibility to, to interact and uh, uh, to, to become uh, close. And uh, I think that uh, uh, we all need uh, uh, to recover this uh, uh, dimension of uh, working together uh, in, uh, after the, the pandemics. So uh, the essential feature of our initiative is that uh, it intends to be very informal. Uh, we have at the University of Torino other initiatives, uh, much more formal. There is, uh, uh, for instance, the uh, um, School of Higher Study, the Ferdinando Rossi uh, School. We want to be uh, a little more uh, uh, informal than uh, uh, this. Uh, there will be a few credits involved, but uh, uh, not too, too many. What we especially want is to have an environment where there can be an easy connection with uh, teachers and students of different courses uh, with the hope that this may empower uh, the, the regular pathway and uh, the thesis job that uh, they are doing both uh, the choice of the uh, the um, uh, the topic and also the development of the the thesis uh, would like we would like uh, to build uh, a international network uh, uh, making easy uh, for students if they want uh, to to go abroad and uh, to uh, to make uh, experience in other laboratories which is uh, has been and uh, always is fundamental in uh, in science now uh, we will start uh, recruiting uh, uh, before uh, summer and uh, we uh, think to uh, start uh, uh, the uh, activity uh, at October uh, 22. Uh, the initiative is uh, open to uh, bachelor and uh, master studies, uh, uh, students, sorry, uh, who will be um, recruited by uh, the, the courses. So, uh, and uh, the recruitment will be balanced among the course of uh, studies. Uh, Besides those uh, that I mentioned in uh, the slide, more courses are welcome. We really want to be an open initiative and an open uh, environment. Uh, the expected outcomes of this are uh, inspiring discussions, uh, inspiring seminars, uh, to establish working connections between uh, students and, teaching, and teachers of uh, uh, different courses, uh, resulting in uh, multidisciplinary and uh, interdisciplinary uh, work. And uh, the, what we hope uh, to have uh, as a final product uh, is to have uh, apprentice scientists uh, more competitive uh, for uh, working on the edge of biological uh, research. And what we think is that uh, dynamics uh, is uh, really the edge of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, the biological uh, uh, research now because uh, uh, we are used to quite a, a static view of uh, biology, biology uh, with a lot of the description, uh, connection, uh, but uh, the real challenge is uh, uh, to uh, develop a, a real understanding of biology in uh, time because uh, uh, this is uh, uh, really uh, fundamental. And 
That's why I'm uh, particularly grateful uh, uh, to Professor Young for uh, having uh, accepted uh, our uh, invitation because uh, I could not think of uh, a best way of uh, um, uh, kicking off our uh, uh, initiative uh, to start with. Uh, and uh, uh, um, before giving you the, a, form, a more formal presentation of uh, uh, Professor uh, Young, uh, I want to, to remark that uh, he's uh, uh, and still an extremely uh, active uh, uh, scientist, uh, providing a seminal contribution. Uh, uh, one the, of the latest is uh, on uh, um, social uh, uh, isolation and uh, uh, another example of, of uh, how uh, we can move from uh, uh, genetically tractable organism uh, uh, to uh, implications that uh, have really uh, far uh, uh, the, the possibility to far reach even uh, to uh, to human. Um, and um, <clears throat> this will probably not be the main topic of uh, uh, today's uh, presentation. But uh, uh, Professor Young will uh, have uh, uh, another. Uh, um, uh, another uh, uh, lecture at the uh, Collegio Borromeo in uh, uh, Pavia. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to them because we co-organized uh, his uh, um, visit uh, to Italy. And also this will be uh, available online. I will uh, uh, send a link to all uh, people uh, who uh, are in our uh, main list and uh, also on uh, uh, our uh, media. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, uh, I would like to uh, to thank uh, uh, many people and in institutions, uh, University of uh, Turin and the Department of Neuroscience for the uh, support uh, to our uh, initiative, uh, the Academy of Science for inspiring uh, us in doing this and also for uh, hosting us today in this uh, beautiful uh, room. The Neuroscience Institute uh, Cavalieri uh, Ottolenghi, uh, where we have our uh, uh, Biological, uh, our neurobiology um, research uh, today, uh, the Neuroscience Institute of Turin, the um, Italian uh, uh, Society of, of uh, Neuroscience, uh, and uh, two people in particular, uh, Michele Caselle uh, from uh, the Department of Physics, uh, uh, whom we, we started discussing about this uh, idea, and uh, Rodolfo Costa from uh, uh, the University of Padua, uh, who helped me a lot in organizing uh, uh, today's uh, event. Um, okay, and uh, uh, now um, I will uh, leave the stage to uh, Professor Young. I, uh, uh, and uh, I, I, I don't really, I think uh, Professor Young doesn't really need uh, a presentation uh, because uh, um, there is uh, a, long, uh, a long list of uh, uh, prizes and uh, awards uh, culminating with the Nobel Prize in uh, Medicine or Physiology in 2017. Um, Professor Young is a member of the National Academy of uh, Science, uh, is uh, a member of the uh, American uh, Philosophical Society, and uh, uh, is uh, uh, vice president of uh, Rockefeller University for uh, uh, Academic uh, uh, Affairs. Uh, I'm very... Uh, I'm really glad that... Uh, to have uh, Professor Young uh, today here, and uh, uh, I also thank you all for your uh, uh, attention. Professor Young, the stage is yours. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, Ferdinando for uh, 
uh, the nice introduction and uh, for describing the goals of the talent school, which, which uh, thinking about my own history as a student uh, bring, brings back memories of the importance of those early uh, advisors that one encounters and how uh, very often uh, a student really doesn't have a plan until uh, they've encountered this kind of a program. So it's uh, a remarkable story and, and uh, extremely fitting that it's on behalf of uh, Professor Levy and his uh, uh, extraordinary uh, ability to find and mentor uh, students who've uh, founded areas of biology that we're all extremely familiar with. Uh, everything from genetics and molecular biology, developmental neuroscience, uh, the biology of uh, cells and, and their viruses, animal cells and their viruses. It's a really a remarkable story. So I'm, when I heard the, uh, when I got the invitation to do this and realized what uh, the talent school was, I was very happy to uh, accept the invitation, invitation to uh, visit. And of course it's wonderful to be here in uh, this part of Italy. Uh, and uh, so thank you for the invitation. What I'm gonna speak about today, uh, you see on this, uh, uh, in this title, uh, is work that uh, goes back uh, for us uh, several decades. I'll just uh, point out that uh, our interest in biological clocks and circadian rhythms uh, goes back uh, uh, to my childhood, really. And uh, I can give you examples of how, uh, uh, if you look uh, carefully, you can see evidence of these clocks all around us. Uh, this is an example that comes from the uh, southwestern uh, United States. Uh, my wife and I have a place uh, in the uh, southwestern semi-arid uh, areas of New Mexico. And uh, we were out one day uh, on, a, on a walk, and uh, I snapped these pictures. One at the top I've snapped, uh, I, I took at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, and the second picture I've taken at 6 p.m. Uh, on the way back uh, from our walk. And what, uh, what you see in the top picture is um, a plant with many blooms that look like uh, they've either died uh, or are, uh, for whatever reason, they're not open. And just four hours later, what you can see, it's, it's uh, very much, it should be obvious that these are the, here's a stick, so there's no, no cheating involved here. <laughs> this is the same plant. And yet you see one uh, image where the, the blooms are all open and looking fresh and the other uh, closed. And in thinking about what might be useful about this kind of plant behavior, uh, this timing of the opening of blooms, this is an arid environment, water's precious, it takes a great deal of water to pump out into the leaves and into these blooms. The, uh, these flowers are pollinated by a night active uh, moth, a hawk moth. And uh, apparently the hawk moth and the uh, plant have come to know what, each other uh, very well and uh, have closed their uh, adaptive uh, uh, behaviors so that the arrival of a hawk moth is accompanied by the opening uh, of these blooms in a rhythmic fashion. This preserves light, uh, preserves uh, water uh, for the plant and of course provides uh, uh, pollination uh, due to the uh, behavior, the night time behavior of the, uh, of the hawk moth. More familiar uh, are animal rhythms that uh, we're all aware of. We're all aware of our own sleep-wake cycles. Uh, what I like to show is this record of a, uh, this is a flying squirrel that was uh, followed by Pat de Courcy in 1960. And uh, she followed this, this uh, squirrel's activity uh, in a cage in a dark room uh, constant food and water, but no indications of time, uh, no environmental cycles. Uh, and she's following it for 25 days, going from uh, uh, the top of the slide to the bottom of the slide. So each one of these lines is another day, a successive day. And 
uh, the deflections from the line, these darker bars, are when the animal is on uh, a running wheel in the cage. And what I'm still amazed to see is that day after day, the precision with which the animal gets on and off of that running wheel, you can predict by two or three minutes when the animal is going to become active. And uh, the other feature of this that I think is of special interest is that this is not exactly 24 hours. This is not a vertical pattern. This is a pattern that moves off to the left at a diagonal, which means what's ever, whatever is controlling this uh, is not in sync with the outside environment, that the animal's not somehow picking up something uh, that uh, is not uh, apparent. Uh, there's an endogenous timing that must be responsible for the shorter uh, periodicity of this rhythm. It's about 24 hours, but it's not precisely 24 hours. In fact, in this case, it's about 23 and a half hours. So there's something internal doing this. Now, in the 1970s, uh, uh, scientists, uh, again, working with rodents, began to ask uh, to do neuroanatomical uh, neuro, uh, studies to try to determine where uh, in the brain uh, might be located the source of this information about timing that could drive those uh, rhythms that I showed in the last slide. And uh, this uh, is... Uh, 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 work that was uh, done by Bill Schwartz at the University of Massachusetts back in the 1970s. And uh, the animals were given uh, radioactive uh, glucose, deoxyglucose, in their drinking water. And this will act as a, as a rapidly metabolized uh, radio label that will show metabolic activity in the brain. So you should be able to see different metabolic level, levels of metabolic activity by uh, using that as a tracer. And what you notice down here is an area uh, in the hypothalamus <clears throat> uh, called the SCN, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, very heavily labeled uh, during the day, but not labeled detectably uh, at night. So there was an oscillation in the metabolic activity of this small part uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the brain, part of the hypothalamus. But it was later to learn that if surgically, surgical ablation of this area of the brain was sufficient to eliminate the rhythmic activities that I just showed you, that surgical abl ablation would produce arrhythmia. Uh, all of that beautiful rhythmicity uh, eliminated. On the other hand, it was also learned that if a donor SCN were transplanted into a lesioned animal, into the, <clears throat> one of these ventricles uh, associated with the SCN, those rhythms could be restored, which tells us quite a lot. It tells us that, yes, indeed, this is not just a, a command uh, detection center. It actually can command those rhythms in some fashion to the point that you can tr do transplantations of tissues between animals and get this to happen. So the real question that we had, uh, I began as a student about the time these experiments were doing, uh, but a student working with uh, a genetically tractable uh, organism, a simpler organism, the insect Drosophila, um, Melanogaster fruit flies. And uh, uh, at about the time I was uh, starting up graduate school, this paper came out in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences by uh, <coughs> uh, someone probably well known to most of you, Seymour Benzer and his student, Ron Kanavka. Uh, Seymour Benzer uh, worked very closely with Salvador uh, Luria. Uh, again, uh, 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 Salvador Luria was, as already mentioned, one of the um, originators of modern genetics and molecular biology, and Seymour Benzer was, uh, was coming up uh, at about the same time. But Seymour, uh, uh, went from studying uh, uh, bacterial viruses, bacteriophage, to studying behavior in Drosophila uh, in the 1960s and 1970s. And in this paper described uh, mutations that they'd recovered in a screen looking for circadian mutants. It was known that Drosophila had uh, rhythmic patterns of uh, behavior, much like that uh, rodent that I showed uh, 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 behavioral records for. And uh, what, uh, what they did was to mutagenize the animals and then ask for mutants, which 
showed uh, aberrant behavior. And they found three uh, mutants, all by screening just the X chromosome of the animal. One of the mutants uh, had a fast running clock, 19 hours, so every day ends and begins again after 19 hours. Another mutant, 28 hours instead of roughly 24 hours. And then a third mutant, which was arrhythmic. So every conceivable uh, change uh, in the in, in, in pattern, which strongly suggested you'd hit the gears of a clock in some fashion. Somehow, in order to change the pace and also with other mutants eliminate, uh, uh, all of this suggested that the, the, the clock, a, a central clock had been damaged in some fashion. The other remarkable thing about these is all as you see in the last line of this abstract, all three of the mutations behave genetically as if they were part of the same functional gene. Of course, those are abstract, that's abstract information, and are they really part of the same gene, and what in the world is the gene doing? It's a little bit like saying, uh, you, you've taken things down to a tissue in the brain called the SCN, now what's going on inside that tissue that's uh, producing at the molecular level, what's producing these oscillations? So I, uh, again, was a beginning graduate student and realized that the location, the rough location of the gene that uh, Kanopka and Benzer had mapped was somewhere in this boxed area shown here, uh, which is part of the uh, X chromosome of the, of, the, uh, of the fly. These are these, uh, you may have heard of these giant polytene chromosomes that uh, have been so useful to geneticists for about 100 years now. And uh, what, uh, what I realized is that this is a region that is among the, at the time, was among the best studied genetically in any organism. And in fact, in one small region, subregion, uh, uh, it was thought that mutations in every functional gene had been collected and identified and ordered along the chromosome. And a, a sort of a, a drawing of that is, is shown here. So each of these chromo chromosome bands in this uh, drawn uh, piece of a polytene chromosome uh, was assumed to carry a gene, and certainly uh, genes had been mapped to them. Uh, but what I uh, realized at the time were there were several chromosomal rearrangements, translocations, deficiencies, duplications, with breakpoints that I could use to, to, to locate, to try to locate uh, this new gene that uh, Kanopka and Benzer uh, had found. And indeed, uh, applying all of these uh, indicated that, that the gene uh, uh, was resided somewhere here, uh, and uh, it, right in the middle of this region where you see the indication PER, which was the name given to this gene. Uh, uh, we did several tests to determine whether any of the mutations that had previously been isolated in that region uh, were other examples of, of this locus. Uh, none were. So it seemed like the only phenotype associated with mutations of this gene uh, were going to be uh, these novel uh, behavioral phenotypes, uh, rhythm, rhythm uh, phenotypes. The other important uh, outcome of this work, which was before cloning uh, uh, was even on the horizon, was that I discovered a translocation uh, shown here as T14JC43. This is a simple reciprocal translocation between the X chromosome and the fourth chromosome, an exchange uh, of parts so that you now had two new uh, newly derived chromosomes. That uh, chromosome uh, broke the period locus. Uh, it behaved like an arrhythmic uh, mutant. So it was a fourth mutant, but it was a very valuable mutant because uh, later when the ability to clone uh, DNA came along, it would have been in the early 1980s uh, quite impossible to find point mutations, which were what the original mutations of Kanopka and Benzer were. It would be quite impossible to locate those uh, in 10 or 20 or 30 uh, uh, thousand base pairs of DNA. On the other hand, you can't miss a chromosomal breakpoint. You begin to collect DNA, you walk along a chromosome, and suddenly you've gone from the X chromosome to the fourth chromosome. That's your break, that's the location of the gene you want to study. And uh, as a result, in 1984, 
uh, we and colleagues at uh, Brandeis, uh, Michael Rossbash and Jeff Hall and their group, uh, isolated this uh, gene, the period locus, and uh, uh, over the next uh, few years, uh, learned a lot about its molecular biology. Uh, we realized it encoded a single protein that had uh, that oscillated in its level over the course of night and day, and had some uh, 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 similarity to previously uh, observed uh, transcription factors. Uh, it seemed like uh, there was a limit to what we could learn from looking at that first gene. Uh, it didn't tell us how a clock worked. It gave us a piece of a clock, we hoped, but uh, we decided that a strategy that we needed to take at that point was to look for additional genes using uh, what we call forward genetics, just mutagenize blindly, uh, collect uh, the res resulting mutants and look for mutants that affected circadian clocks, but now on other chromosomes in addition to the X chromosome. And uh, this, is a, uh, this is a montage. This is a, a Photoshop version, <laughs> a recreation uh, of the experiment that was done over uh, uh, a year and a half's time. And what you're looking at are 7,000 bottles of uh, uh, Drosophila cultures and some uh, postdocs and students standing in the back for, uh, for scale. And uh, what two of our postdocs, uh, Jeff Price and Amita Sigal did, they went through every one of these bottles which contained butagenized flies, looking for something that had an aberration uh, in circadian clock. Now, uh, Ron Kanapka had found his mutants in the first couple of hundred flies. So we thought maybe this would be not such a difficult task, but we didn't find another mutant for 7,000. Uh, it took 7,000 bottles of flies to find a second mutant. But the second mutant turned out to be extremely important. We named the, the mutant Timeless. And uh, it was important because we learned very quickly that uh, mutations of Timeless affected the production uh, of the period uh, protein and mutations of the period protein affected the production and fate of the timeless gene and protein. Uh, so we had, we had blindly asked, just give us anything that will affect circadian rhythms. And the system had told us, well, here's another piece of something. And lo and behold, it's a piece of the same mechanism we already had a first piece of. And this was our first hint that there might be just a single mechanism that is responsible in the fly for its circadian behavior. And this triggered a, a search on our behalf and, and also at Brandeis for as many genes as we could isolate using that kind of a method, mut mut mutation uh, and analysis. And indeed, every new uh, mutant that was picked up from there on out worked in the same system. So what we did was starting from a single gene and then a second gene, we built out uh, a mechanism, all, all of the components that we were able to isolate in the fly that would affect circadian rhythms, all had interactions with the same uh, set of components. So the way this clock works is that you have two genes, uh, period and timeless, again, the first two genes we, we uh, uh, worked with. Uh, those two genes uh, are activated simultaneously by uh, the action of a dimer of two proteins. One is called clock C and the other is called a uh, cycle, which is represented B. And when, when clock and cycle bind to either per or timeless, they cause transcription. Those RNAs are translated into protein in the cytoplasm. Uh, but uh, uh, in some cases, that's where uh, the cycle stops. Uh, in, order, in order for uh, anything uh, useful to happen with a period in timeless, they have to dimerize. They have to form a per tim complex. Only in this complex can these two proteins move back into the nucleus. In the nucleus, these two proteins are inhibitors of clock and cycle. So whereas clock and cycle drive action of these genes, when these proteins are in the nucleus, per and tim are in the nucleus, this causes a cessation of activity. But as soon as these proteins uh, hit 
uh, the cytoplasm, as soon as they're made, there are, are certain breaks depending on time of day. So the per protein uh, can interact not only with the timeless protein, but also with the kinase, which is called, uh, which we name double time. Uh, this kinase uh, physically associates with per, phosphorylates it, and marks it for degradation. Uh, so per has two potential partners. One is timeless and one is double time. When levels of timeless are low, all of the interactions are going to be with double time. And so uh, the period proteins are going to, to turn over. Now, another feature, though, there's also regulation of the accumulation of timeless. So as timeless is translated, uh, there's another protein called cryptochrome, which is a light sensitive protein which when, uh, when it absorbs uh, uh, photons will physically associate with timeless and mark it for degradation. So during the day when the lights are on, cryptochrome is activated, which uh, causes timeless uh, to be uh, degraded. Uh, during the day, no timeless can accumulate and therefore you can't make this pertem complex. All you can make are uh, you can make per, but it will be uh, eliminated by the action of this kinase, double time. So we began to see very quickly what's happening in this clock in a light-dark cycle. When the lights are on, you can't produce per and tim because of these uh, interactions that I mentioned. When the lights go off at sunset, when, when uh, we introduce darkness, cryptochrome is no longer activated, timeless can accumulate, per tim complexes can be produced and the negative arm of this cycle uh, can be completed. So we have a, a day-night uh, shifting back and forth that will occur in response to an environmental cycle. This explains to us in part what happens to us when we have jet lag, how we, how we shift to new time zones, how we are constantly adjusting uh, to, uh, uh, to cycles in the environment, how daylight savings time uh, gives us a headache uh, uh, twice a year if we're if we're exposed to that. Um, so this is this is uh, a simple uh, rendition of the uh, of the mechanism that was observed. But of course, uh, an important question is why does the movement, the cyclical movement of those few proteins, have had uh, any effect on the biology uh, of the animal? It's just a few proteins involved. But in fact, what we found was if we asked, are there cycling genes uh, in other cells uh, in the animal? In any, uh, we find that in essentially every cell uh, of the fly or you and I, uh, there are hundreds of genes that are responding to those signals by producing oscillations. So what this is, is a, this is 20-year-old data microarray data, you remember microarrays, now it's transcriptomics, but uh, 20 years ago is microarrays. Each row of green and red uh, boxes uh, is a single gene. Uh, red represents high levels of expression of the gene, green low levels of expression of the gene. And so what we're doing is we're stacking uh, 150 genes in a fashion that shows uh, expression patterns that are most similar together in, uh, in, this, uh, in this chart. So as you move down the chart, as you move through 24 hours, what you see are lines that are running, you, you see waves of expression, but the waves are running diagonally, indicating that as you, as you move through the day, uh, different groups of genes are coming online, are being produced at their highest levels. So, what these clocks do is they provide a program of gene expression. They provide for an ordered pattern at day after day of hundreds of genes activities. And these are activities that go on not, go on not only in the brain, but in virtually every cell uh, of the fly's body. Now, uh, one last feature I want to tell you about that is that here, here I've just reproduced that schema of 150 genes. Uh, expression patterns. Over here, we instead of looking at uh, six days uh, in, a, in wild type flies, uh, patterns over six days, here we're looking at uh, uh, three days, uh, but in uh, three different mutants, uh, clock, mutant, 
timeless mutant and a period mutant. And what you see over here is chaotic. There's no more uh, rhythmic regulation of these uh, gene activities. Now, this was of interest to us because this, the data on the right side are all taken in a light-dark cycle. The genes that are composing this clock are now eliminated, but the animal has full access to these changing light-dark cycles. So what we've learned is that although this is an adaptation, certainly to a changing environment, a cycling, a cycling world, uh, the animal is now completely dependent on the presence of this operating clock in order to interpret the external environment. The external environment can't drive the activity of these genes. You have to have the clock interposed in order to get this programmed pattern uh, of gene expression. Now, uh, that broad pattern of expression, as I uh, mentioned, is found in many different cells. This, the components of this clock are well conserved in evolution. So our own clo clocks, which I'll talk about in a moment, are very uh, similar to the clock that we uh, identified in the fly. But one of the things that we, we feel is very important about this, recognizing this huge program of rhythmic gene expression is that if we think about disease, if we think about medicine, uh, there's a uh, tremendous uh, uh, overlap between uh, drugs that are most often used to treat disease and this cycling pattern of gene targets. So what this, this is uh, work that was done by a colleague, John Hoganish in Cincinnati uh, a number of years ago. And what uh, John showed is that of the 100 most often prescribed uh, uh, drugs for, for treating a variety of diseases, uh, more than half have targets that are oscillating. Now, of course, a physician has to tell you the dose. What they don't tell you is the time of day to give that drug. Most of us, I think, if we have, if we have to take aspirin or uh, a statin or uh, whatever, uh, you choose the morning or the evening. Uh, most of us don't stop in the middle of the day and say, ah, it's four o'clock, it's time to take uh, uh, medicine X. But uh, on the next slide are shown that half of those oscillating uh, genes or half, half of those uh, drugs that are hitting oscillating gene uh, targets have half-lives of less than six hours, which means if the target you're trying to hit is oscillating with a peak in the evening and you're taking the drug in the morning, you're going to have about 25% of the dose that the doctor prescribed when that target is there to be hit uh, with the drug and vice versa. If you're taking it in the, in the evening and the acrophase of the uh, gene expression pattern is, is morning. So I think this is something for the future that's going to be important. We, we need to know something about the targets of these drugs with regard to time. As uh, Ferdinando mentioned the other day, uh, biology isn't static. The cell changes over time and our targets for medicine change over time. And so I think, again, I think this is gonna be up to the pharmaceutical uh, companies when they're when they're telling a physician how best to uh, uh, apply their uh, products, then there needs to be information about timing and what the targets are doing. Uh, this is uh, something that helps me introduce the notion of jet lag, which I'm now suffering from. <laughs> uh, but this is I, I, I'm essentially describing myself by describing these mice. Uh, Again, because these clocks are present in so many different tissues, essentially every tissue in, in a mouse uh, has a semi-autonomous clock running. Uh, the question emerges, uh, to what degree are all of those clocks synchronous? Under what conditions are they synchronous? And under what conditions do they become asynchronous? So about uh, 15 or 20 years ago, two labs, one run by Uli Schibler in Geneva and another by Michael Meniger in Virginia, uh, asked what happens if we confuse an animal by giving them access to food. If it's a nocturnal animal, a mouse, we give them access to food only for an hour during the middle of the day. Uh, and if, but we keep them in a light-dark cycle 
and we know that they're nocturnal. And so they're not going to want to get up uh, in the middle of the, the day. They're going to be active at night. They ordinarily eat at night. And what was found is that, uh, you know, prior to the experiment, uh, if you look at clocks in all of these different tissues, brain, lung, liver, skeletal muscle, <clears throat> there's agreement. There's synchrony between those clocks. The question is, what's synchronizing them? We know that the clocks uh, are brought together somehow by agreement. After, after uh, a few days of delivering food for just an hour uh, in the middle of the day, the animal develops a new routine, which is they wake up uh, half an hour or so before the food is delivered. They anticipate it. <clears throat> they eat the food, <clears throat> and then they go back to sleep. And then they get up and get on their running wheels all night long. So we've introduced a very odd form of behavior uh, in these animals. What uh, both labs that did this experiment found was that uh, uh, the skeletal muscle, the liver, the lungs, all of those, those clocks shifted away from the positions, the relative positions they had prior to that intervention. The brain, on the other hand, stayed the same. So the brain was apparently listening or following those light-dark cycles, whereas the rest of the body was being influenced by the, uh, uh, the cacophony uh, produced by introducing uh, food at a time of day when the animal should have been asleep. So uh, the reason I call this a jet lag experiment is I suspect this is very much what's happening when uh, you fly from New York to uh, Milan, or Torino. Uh, that uh, uh, right now I have uh, uh, my liver, my lungs, my skeletal muscles somewhere out over the Atlantic. And, uh, um, but my brain should be here, uh, fortunately. But I think, I think that's a better explanation of what's going on with jet lag than just the notion that your, your whole body is in the long, wrong time zone. It's that your body is now strung across uh, multiple time zones. So I'd like to finish up by talking a little bit about uh, a human problem. Uh, again, most of our work, uh, our work began uh, using a model organism, Drosophila, but we've, uh, a few years ago we began to study uh, a human sleep disorder called delayed sleep phase disorder. And this is a, uh, a fairly common uh, problem encountered in the U.S. Maybe as much as 5% of the U.S. population is thought to, uh, uh, has been diagnosed, would be diagnosed with uh, DSPD. Uh, this is a, a persistent delay in the timing of the major sleep uh, episodes. So these are night owls. These are people, that's why you saw this uh, this uh, picture before, you've got someone tapping away on the computer in the middle of the night. That's probably familiar to many of you for uh, other reasons. Uh, but for some people, that is a, a normal pattern of life. You, you wake up late, you stay, uh, you prefer to, to have a phase shift in your uh, behavior. You're a night owl. So a persistent delay in timing of that major sleep episode and, and resistant to efforts to advance sleep. Now, these are... These are uh, uh, actigraphic studies of uh, two patients. One is a control patient, the one on top A. The other is a DSPD patient that uh, we were, uh, uh, that became a part of a study that I'll tell you about. And uh, what uh, we have mapped here, this is uh, the mapping here. This is nighttime. And uh, each subject is, uh, has an activity watch on the wrist. And so you see, just like those rodent patterns that we saw before, you see activity of the moving wrist when the, when the uh, person is, um, is uh, active. And uh, uh, when they're asleep, you see uh, little uh, relative uh, uh, movement of the wrist. The uh, subjects are each asked to keep a sleep log uh, tell us in red when you uh, get into bed and tell us in blue when you get out of bed. Keep that in your log. And they do this for a number of days. So what you see is that our control subject up here has a very tight pattern. Every day it does much the same. Uh, sleep times are initiated at about the same time each day. Wake times are initiated each day at about the same time. Down here we have a, a, a chaos going on in this DSPD uh, subject. Uh, activity is spread uh, uh, around in a chaotic fashion. Most of the uh, 
uh, bedtimes are scattered in here, but they're all delayed relative to the, the control uh, individual. They're all starting quite late, often uh, around midnight uh, or later. And uh, wake times in blue uh, can be quite late, uh, very often in this subject uh, around noon the following day. So the, the, there's a, a huge shift uh, underlying this uh, more chaotic uh, picture that's shown here with regard to uh, sleep-wake uh, cycle. So that uh, subject that you just saw the activity record is shown here. Uh, these are several other members uh, of an extended uh, kindred of a family, uh, uh, relatives uh, of that uh, proband. Those in dark, those, those that are colored uh, black, all show delayed sleep phase uh, disorder. This cousin over here does not. And uh, what we did at this point was whole, G whole exome sequencing of all the members of the family. And that resulted in the identification of a single point mutation in a familiar gene, cryptochrome. Uh, this is a point mutation that lies uh, just downstream, actually in the splice donor site uh, of uh, uh, exon 11 of this uh, 13 exon composed uh, transcription unit uh, encoding cryptochrome 1. Now, that mutation in that splice donor site predicts that the splice acceptor on uh, exon 12 will now be spliced to exon 10, and exon 11 will be eliminated. And in fact, what that predicts is that we'll miss 72 base pairs and 24 amino acids from the products of this gene. And in fact, if we look at the RNA produced uh, by a number of different uh, uh, controls and uh, uh, experimentals, we see that this one, tau11, uh, produces both forms of the RNA. They're heterozygous for this uh, mutation. And they also produce two forms of the protein. So these individuals are, in fact, uh, expressing that altered uh, form uh, of protein as predicted by the nature of the mutation. Now, we wanted to know if we could prove that that mutation would cause a behavioral phenotype or a clock phenotype, a change in the running of the clock. And that's shown here using something that I think uh, Professor Levy would uh, uh, appreciate. We're now not using patients, we're using cultured cells. This is an in vitro experiment where we're taking cells that have no cryptochrome on their own and now we're giving them back cryptochrome, either wild type cryptochrome over here in four different sets of experiments or this mutant form of cryptochrome uh, shown over here. And what you see is that we have a different uh, rhythm uh, produced in those cultured cells if we give the altered form of cryptochrome versus the full length uh, form of cryptochrome. We get a longer period rhythm, a 32.1 hour rhythm in those cultured cells on average, uh, about a half an hour uh, change in the rhythmicity. Uh, so that confirmed that this uh, mutation had a, a, an impact on circadian biology. Uh, now, I need to tell you a little bit about the human clock because it's not exactly like uh, the fly clock, but uh, to understand how cryptochrome might uh, do this, might cause this, this uh, DSPD. Uh, in, in humans, instead of having timeless interact with PER, now cryptochrome is the uh, partner for PER. You remember cryptochrome was controlling timeless previously, but in humans, and in, in flies, but in humans, cryptochrome interacts directly with PER. So it's a PER cry complex that inhibits uh, clock and BMAL, orthologs of clock and cycle in the fly, to uh, make this uh, cycle operate. So seeing that cryptochrome was now behave, behaving as a transcriptional inhibitor, we wanted to ask whether or not there were physical changes in interactions between cryptochrome and PER, or between the per cry complexes and these clock BMAL complexes that might help explain uh, why these uh, clocks were changing, changing pace. And this is a, uh, these are a, a series of interaction studies, biochemical interaction studies, where we're looking at the strength of interaction between these proteins. And I'll just start down here with one in which we've 
added a tag, hemagglutinin, to the clock protein, and we've now challenged uh, that with either the full-length form of uh, cryptochrome protein or the truncated form of the cryptochrome protein, or we put it into cells with a hetero with a an equal mixture of the full length and the altered truncated form of the protein. And what you see is this is these are the input proteins that the immunoprecipitation has to deal with. But what you see is that the full length protein is recovered with much less avidity than the truncated form of the protein. And if we have a mixture, it's almost entirely the truncated protein that is brought down. So there's a, a much greater interaction uh, between uh, the uh, inhibiting side of this uh, complex and the activating side. There's a much stronger interaction between the inhibitors and the activators uh, in this, with this form of cryptochrome, uh, which would suggest that there's a stronger inhibition that's supplied uh, even in a heterozygote. Uh, in these uh, in these individuals, so recent structural uh, studies by uh, Kerry Parch at uh, University of California, uh, Santa Cruz, have indicated that the tail of cryptochrome wraps around uh, the bulk of that protein, and in fact, that exon ordinarily lies across uh, a pocket that allows cryptochrome. This is cryptochrome in purple. The, that green pocket is the association region for clock. So the inhibitor inhibits by uh, a contacting activator clock uh, through that region. And this tail is dynamically interacting with, in a wild type protein, that region and forming, it's believed, an auto inhibitor. It's regulating the level of interaction between the repressor and the activator. Uh, in a wild type protein. Now, what we've done, or what this mutation has done, is to eliminate that opportunity for auto regulation. And so now we have uh, an untethered repressor that has uh, a, a significantly additional force in its inactivation potential. So, uh, uh, one of the most uh, surprising aspects of this uh, study was that when we uh, looked at DNA databases, which are now uh, extremely abundant in many forms. We found that the number of copies of this mutation is really quite significant, especially in Europe. In Europe, uh, about a half a percent of the copies of this, uh, of this cryptochrome gene are that mutant allele. Now, since this works in heterozygotes, since you can be a carrier, the carrier frequency is going to be about 1%. So about 1% of non-Finnish Europeans uh, are going to carry this mutation. We're almost a big enough audience to think that somebody in here might carry this mutation. So uh, that struck us as uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the frequency, the higher frequency of this uh, uh, was very surprising to us, but it opened an opportunity. It suggested that we would be able to identify uh, new carriers to either confirm or reject uh, the impressions that we'd seen from our earlier studies. So we collaborated with uh, a group in Bilkent, uh, Tafun uh, Ozalek uh, at Bilkent University in Turkey, who had already identified for other reasons many, many families that had been genotyped. And uh, we uh, uh, were able to study seven large kindreds uh, that had both carriers and non-carriers segregating within those kindreds. And these are just examples of some of those kindreds with black indicating carriers and white circles and squares indicating uh, wild-type non-carriers. And what's important, is, I can just focus you down here on the summary uh, map here. We've got a clock face that indicates the timing of the mid-sleep point and controls uh, uh, on the right in black, or the DSPD carriers, the, the uh, uh, cryptochrome one uh, delta carriers here on the left. And what you see is the mid-sleep point uh, in, the, uh, in the controls is about 4 to 4.30 in the morning. Uh, and those of the uh, carriers of this cryptochrome uh, mutation 
uh, another two, two and a half year, hours uh, later, but uh, also uh, a distribution of, uh, of mid-sleep times that is, uh, is much broader. So there's, there's a general shift in the pattern, but there's also more chaos uh, in the sleep patterns of those individuals. So this, we think, confirmed the uh, earlier indication that this uh, mutation confirms a, a strong uh, effect on sleep. Now, let me just summarize. Uh, in studies of several unrelated families, uh, the presence of this mutation predicted delayed sleep phase disorder. And the penetrance and frequency, uh, again, 1% of uh, non-Finnish Europeans suggest that this may uh, contribute to uh, this disorder uh, uh, significantly world worldwide. Since the mutation affects multiple members of every family that we've looked at, we assume that it's not just the behavior, it's not just the sleep-wake behavior that's affected, but all processes in all these tissues should be running uh, in, a, in a different fashion uh, in these individuals. And we have not examined the physiology more broadly yet, but it's a, an, a large and I think important uh, question for the future. Uh, as I pointed out, this mutant protein binds uh, more avidly to uh, the activators, clock and BMAL, in both mouse and human cells. Uh, it seems to be a, trans uh, a strengthened transcriptional inhibitor, which could account for the change in um, uh, the nature of the clock, the periodicity, the rhythmicity of the clock. Uh, the competitive binding that I showed you uh, suggest a basis for the inheritance of this as a dominant trait. It's, it's elbowing out the wild type form of the protein and making uh, so that the system, the cell chooses this new aberrant form of the protein uh, for most uh, of the action in the clock. And uh, uh, finally, I've shown that, uh, uh, I didn't show you the human data, but I showed you uh, mouse data that uh, shows how these uh, uh, how this mutation can lengthen the period of the circadian rhythm. And finally, I just want to close by saying that, you know, these databases are becoming, these human databases are becoming large and extremely useful. And I think, you know, thinking about what the talent school is going to be doing with bioinformatics, uh, you know, the, 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 the data that are going to be available in the uh, future are just... Uh, uh, phenomenal already. The database we've been using is, uh, has risen to 140,000 whole exomes. I think UK Biobank is about half a million. Uh, there are enough fully sequenced exomes out there now to uh, suggest that every critical, clinically significant sleep disorder is probably already represented in those databases. Uh, the question is, how are you going to find them? How are you going to test them? So uh, the strategy that we've uh, uh, taken up is that uh, instead of trying to identify the individuals first, let's scan the databases. We know a lot about the genes that are controlling these clocks. Let's scan those genes and ask, are there mutations in those genes that suggest an alteration in function of some of these critical components? What we would use is uh, a, 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 a cultured cell model which, again, is a nod toward uh, Professor Levy's own contributions, I think. Uh, but use a, a cultured cell model <clears throat> uh, in the way that I've shown to ask, uh, does a mutation that looks like it might be interesting cause a change in the circadian clock in a cultured cell? If it does, then it's time to look uh, for patients carrying or for subjects carrying that mutation. But we can very rapidly go through those kinds of experiments uh, and, uh, and I think get a fuller, uh, a more complete picture of the genetics of uh, uh, sleep disorder uh, in, hum in a, a broad uh, swath of the human population. So uh, I just want to close by uh, telling you a bit about people that have done the work, the human work that I just talked about uh, was done by a postdoc, Alina Potke, who's now at Caltech, has her own lab at Caltech. This was a collaboration with uh, two scientists at Wow Cornell, uh, uh, and uh, a third, uh, a medical doctor, also at Wild Cornell, Anna Krieger. And I mentioned our, uh, our uh, colleagues in Turkey, uh, Tayfun Ozalek and Anur 
Amir Anat, uh, a student of his that, uh, that collected the data uh, from uh, subjects in, in Turkey. But most of all, I want to point to the real hero of this story, which I don't think, this, this is, this is a, a process, this is a, a piece of biology that I don't think we could have started uh, in a complex organism. We needed something with easily uh, generated genetics with the proper mutations. The mutations were first identified in the fly. So uh, 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 the fact that we can look at humans today and ask these questions about sleep, I think uh, we, have to, we have to respect the contribution that uh, this little fruit fly has made in bringing us to a condition where we can do that. So thank you very much. Appreciate your attention, and again, it's uh, terrific to be here uh, on this occasion. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very, very stimulating talk. Uh, mm -hmm. Could we open the discussion? Or Certainly. Certainly. Possible. And uh, I would like to enlarge the discussion also to speakers that are there before, I mean, so we can generally speak. So, how we can organize? Let's ask. Please. Okay, um, I have a question for the Professor Young. Sure. That is something to think about uh, that emerged by your talk that was very nice. And so we work a lot with cell culture on cancer, so something else. But I was wondering if now we must to take account when we make our experiments and when we handle our cell culture, because we never thought about that. We make experiment in the morning, in the afternoon, and this how could we impact? And if you have data about that or suggestion, thank yeah. you. No, this is a great point, and it is uh, uh, essential to think about these things. There's a, a quick story I can tell about a colleague, Uli Schibler, who was working on a transcription factor and had two postdocs working in the lab. And one postdoc said uh, the transcription factor. Uh, was produced very abundantly. The other postdoc said, no, it's not. It's hardly, I can hardly find any of it at all. And, and uh, uh, Schibler got up and said, look, I want you to do it together. Do the experiment side by side. And of course, what they did was they took the experiment to the same time. It wasn't that they, it wasn't the doing side by side that made the difference. It was that they did it at the same time. Then they both got the answer the same answer, but then they realized, well, but one of us has changed the time that we're doing the experiment. Now let's both do it side by side at the other time. Now they both got the other answer. So that's how one oscillating uh, gene was found very early on, was by paying attention to time in a mouse experiment. And uh, I tell all my colleagues that are doing metabolic experiments, for example, back uh, home at Rockefeller, that they've picked it up. They say, okay, we understand. We, we have to take time points on anything that we're, that we're measuring. And I think, uh, you know, with uh, roughly half the genome oscillating robustly, and, you know, if you want to, if you're, especially uh, if you want to make sure you're going to get consistent hours, uh, uh, consistent answers, then uh, accommodating time, again, as uh, uh, Fernando had pointed out, uh, 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 previously is going to be uh, essential. So I'm glad you, especially for a group of scientists thinking about how to plan experiments in the future, I think it's it's very important to at least consider whether or not your results might be uh, have an impact uh, depending on time that the experiment is performed. Raises another question about clinical trials. Uh, you know, in many cases, uh, you hear it said that, you know, the mouse is not performing as a good uh, subject for, uh, it doesn't fit the human uh, pattern, so it's not a good model for, for uh, uh, pharmaceutical testing. Well, that depends on whether you're using the mouse properly. Are you using the mouse at night and comparing that to what the human is doing during the day, or are you mixing it up? So 
many levels at which this, I think, is going to be important. Some other questions, please. Please, go ahead. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I think this, co this topic is very fascinating. So I have a really question about uh, animals that do not live, uh, um, for example, animals that live underwater. Mm -hmm. So they do not have our cycles uh, because there is no uh, the same effect of the sun. So do you think uh, they have a different uh, clock. Uh, do you know if there are studies about this? Yeah, uh, and it varies. Uh, in some cases, there's. It, it seems that the animals have lost the clock. Uh, and in other cases, uh, uh, you have animals that live underground, and they still have rhythms. Uh, they don't have eyes. In, in some cases, they're not functional eyes. Uh, but they still have clocks. And I think the important thing to keep in mind here is all of those situations, bottom of the sea, deep in caves, et cetera, those animals didn't evolve there. They evolved on the surface. So they almost certainly, if they're, uh, if they're multicellular, they had clocks uh, before they took on these uh, altered uh, homes. Uh, and so they've either adopted uh, different ways of using those clocks or they've been, they're like uh, appendages that have been lost. But there's so much uh, in metabolism, for example, that is regulated by these clocks. And in many cases, you see, even though the animal's not responding to light, for example, it's, it's still showing rhythms uh, in its uh, gene expression patterns when you, when you look at that level. So. Please. Just a naive question. Let's go back to Drosophila. You said that you had a mutant that uh, lost the clock. I mean, there are some mutant that uh, anticipated or were late, but one lost completely the clock. What happens to this mutant? Like, they live happily or not? Ah. Well, you know, they survive in the lab. This is not a lethal mutation in, in the laboratory. But, uh, you know, if you put those out in your backyard and come back in six months, they're not there anymore. Uh, so this is, this is something that, uh, that certainly has an adaptive value where the animal's life depends on it. It's, but it, it's not, it's not uh, a, the mutations are not lethal. In the, in the sense that a developmental mutation can be lethal, for example, uh, or a metabolic mutation might be lethal. Uh, but um, instead, it appears that these are, these are advantages that were gained over time. That advantage is lost. And you see, when you do a, a population study, you see the impact of, of that kind of damage uh, or that kind of a loss. There, there is a... Um, uh, there are experiments by another scientist uh, at Vanderbilt, uh, Carl Johnson, uh, who works on cyanobacteria, looking at uh, the impact uh, not only of a lost clock, but of clocks that are running with a period, a rhythmicity that doesn't fit the environment. And what they can do in those cases is, of course, modify the environment to be a mutant-like environment uh, or not. And what what uh, uh, Johnson has found is that wild-type animals do more poorly than mutants if you have the mutant environment. That is, if you have a fast cycling environment and a, and a wild-type clock. So you can see those in chemostats. You can see winners and losers coming out of that. So there's clearly selection for individuals that are well-matched to the environment with regard uh, to their rhythmicity. Uh, but it doesn't happen all at once. It's a, it's a population phenomenon uh, over time. Okay, some other questions? I have a question that uh, is more related to population genetics, and uh, I was struck by the frequency of uh, uh, the 
the crime mutation. Uh, so uh, do you think uh, there is uh, any value for uh, some uh, human subpopulation for this? Yeah, it's a, it's a great thought. Uh, and, you know, in, in thinking also about the fact that you only find this at that high frequency uh, among Europeans, for example, or descendants of Europeans that have, have moved uh, elsewhere suggests that maybe this mutation is not very old. It arose somewhere uh, in the area and has had a limited uh, spread over time. But uh, whether it's actually had uh, beneficial impact so that it's still with us, uh, it could be a hitchhiker. Right. There could be it, uh, its location on the chromosome could be close to something else that has uh, caused it to be dragged along as a as a favorable uh, along with a favorable uh, mutation. We don't know this yet, uh, but uh, uh, perhaps recreating something like this in mice uh, and doing population studies could uh, could get us closer to that kind of an answer. But we've we've wondered about this, uh, too. It's. Uh, it is remarkable that it's gotten that high in some populations. Uh, I think Ashkenazi populations, it's even higher. So um, it could be a pioneer effect, a founder effect. Uh, we just don't know yet. Let me ask something about that. Yeah. Uh, do you think there are some, in your table, there are some difference in European population about the disorder? Is it true? I'm sorry? I mean, in your population yes. table, there are some differences in frequency of this. Yes, yes. Do you think it has some evolutionary meaning or random or what? Because yeah. it's, it's not so easy to... Well, you can't find it in East Asia, for example. Yeah, okay. So I'm, I'm, I think uh, my interpretation, I think it, it, it uh, is perhaps most likely that it arose somewhere in or near Europe and has, you know, those populations have expanded somewhat, but it hasn't, mm -hmm. it hasn't moved into other uh, populations, indicating that it's probably young. Uh, you know, it, it probably arose after these populations moved to these uh, eastward uh, and, uh, and has not, and, and migrations have not carried it into those populations. But it's very difficult to test this. Well, again, we don't we don't find uh, we don't find it at comparable frequencies in those populations. So uh, I'm not sure that there are other easy explanations than than just imagining that it arose after those populations had had moved eastward. And uh, do you have observed some difference between Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews? Uh, because this uh, is something that uh, may be given some indication. Of. Yeah, you know, the, the only data I've seen are for Ashkenazi. And so I don't, I don't know that if you begin to look at other partitions that you would find, uh, uh, you would find similar or very different uh, numbers. Uh, probably it should be possible to dig that out uh, at this point. But, yeah, because I think it's, a, I mean, in many diseases, this is... It may also give clues about when this arose. It might have first arisen in a population. That population has uh, has now expanded. Uh, and so if you really uh, uh, try to recreate the history, the evolutionary history of this, it could be uh, quite uh, uh, intriguing uh, to, to uh, try to trace the origins of this and the expansions. And of course, we don't know where it's going to be in the future. Uh, and we don't know whether that it's hitchhiking or actually providing uh, some positive. Well, uh, it's a yeah. little bit. Yeah. Uh, some, some other questions, please. Sir. Yeah. Greetings, Professor. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, I, my question is uh, related to melatonin. So we're aware that melatonin can affect circadian rhythms and it acts mainly in the brain. So it can be found in cerebrospinal fluid and in the blood. But the difference in it is a fold, like tenfold or even more. Uh, but uh, 
Pharmaceutical melatonin as a drug that we buy, uh, it works nonetheless. Uh, that's why I wanted to ask, uh, is it possible that uh, if we affect multiple local clock systems in different tissues, they together can affect the central clock system, which is located in suprachiasmatic nucleus? Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think uh, uh, you can entrain uh, an animal with food that is kept in constant darkness, you can entrain the, the phase. Uh, it depends on the animal. We've tried to do that with Drosophila and haven't had any success. But, uh, you know, rodents, uh, a somewhat different st uh, story. Uh, melatonin, you know, is uh, as you shut your eyes, as the level of light goes down in the room, uh, you, your pineal begins to produce melatonin uh, in, in significant uh, amounts. Turning on the lights causes a cessation in that. You can take melatonin, it'll make you drowsy. Uh, in some organisms, it will reset the clock, but in many others, uh, uh, it'll only make the organism drowsy. It won't, it won't produce a shift in the clock. So the clock is, we know in, in all cases that have been studied, the clock will regulate the release of melatonin, but it's much less clear that melatonin can have that kind of an effect, you know, a resetting effect on the clock uh, broadly across uh, uh, organisms. And of course, we're talking about a mammalian uh, system uh, when we uh, speak of melatonin. Some other questions, maybe? Sir? Yes. Thank you again for your lecture. Um, I wanted to ask, since um, um, a modification in the circadian rhythm are also um, often found in people with, uh, for example, developmental disorders or some mental uh, conditions, and yet mostly it is because of well, stress or environment, but has it has it ever found uh, some sort of maybe correlation with uh, a, a modification of circadian rhythm of instead genetic origin, perhaps uh, genes that are located near to each other or another? Yeah, um, this is something that that we too are uh, interested in. I don't have. Uh, new information to provide, but one of the reasons for doing the uh, studies, uh, if we had a, a battery of known genes that, that cause changes in the clock, uh, in humans, for example, then uh, studying those individuals re uh, relative to controls could give us some insights into whether other uh, psychiatric issues or uh, behavioral issues or fit metabolic issues, any kind of physiological issues accompanied those changes. So again, it's uh, those, we, we know those clocks control more than just uh, behavioral patterns uh, in model organisms. And so the, the question, the very interesting question uh, in human populations is whether there would be a variety of other uh, effects uh, of one of these mutations. So our our first uh, uh, anticipated uh, study would be on this particular variant. Do individuals that carry that variant, if you look at enough of them, do they have other physiological traits or behavioral traits aside from a, a, the impact on sleep? But we don't, but we don't have any answers yet uh, to that. <laughs> Uh, good morning. Um, you've shown us that this uh, circadian clock mechanism is very well uh, conserved across animals. Uh, I was wondering <clears throat> what is known about the conservation of that molecular basis in other organisms, from fungi or, or the nice plants you've shown us at the beginning of your yeah. uh, slideshow. Right, right. Yeah, so for example, in that plant that I showed you, there's a different clock. It, it has, it seems to operate by principles that are similar, but the components are different. Uh, very few of the components uh, uh, even remotely resemble the components that we see in the animal kingdom. 
uh, for example, one of the kinases, casein kinase one seems to be uh, represented both in the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom. Uh, but you know, the transcription factors themselves <clears throat> are quite different. Uh, they have small uh, regions that, uh, that show some relation, but in most cases, those uh, regions have something to do with protein interactions that could have been uh, picked up uh, early during uh, evolution because uh, proteins that were uh, 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 showing functional interactions that were completely uh, dissociated from these particular uh, regulatory systems, nevertheless, were a source for interactive protein sequences. Uh, so if you, so, so the plant world, the fungal world, and the animal world uh, have uh, what we call transcription and translation feedback loops of the sort that we've talked about, where you make a set of transcription factors. Some are positive acting and some are negative acting, and they flip-flop uh, over the course of the day. If we go to cyanobacteria, uh, we find a very different kind of clock. It doesn't resemble this at all. It's, uh, it's in fact a, a clock where, that is uh, composed of a series of uh, kinases and uh, phosphorylases, a, a dephosphorylation de uh, promoting uh, enzymes. And you have cycles of phosphorylation, dephosphorylation that occur with a roughly 24 hour period. That's only found in cyanobacteria. It's not even found in other bacteria. So we, we don't know why it's so narrowly uh, represented in the biological world, but it's certainly uh, perhaps the oldest uh, extant biological clock is that cyanobacterial uh, clock. And then there's a gap between that and these other clocks that arose in, in uh, multicellular uh, organisms. So the, the, uh, the adaptation of a circadian clock has been there for quite a long time, but manifests in at least two different ways uh, over the course of evolution. <clears throat> Some answer questions, please, Sir. Um, dear Professor, I wanted to ask you, what do we know about special features of clock systems of organisms who live on uh, Earth poles where half of year is day and half of year is night? Right, yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that's a great point. And, I, you know, there, I don't know a lot about uh, what happens in those cases. We know that, you know, uh, some organisms migrate, some organisms hibernate, uh, some uh, go into a state of suspension, essentially. I know fruit flies will hide away in a, in a basement in a, in a cold area, uh, a co colder areas that are going through large seasonal uh, fluctuations and become uh, uh, reproductively quiescent, developmentally uh, quiescent. So. Uh, you know, you would you would suspect that uh, animals exposed exposed to constant light over the course of the summer that that would perhaps knock their clocks out. On the other hand, mammals, uh, unlike uh, Drosophila, which are translucent, mammals have internal organ and organs that are uh, you know going to be entrained by other uh, kinds of activities. But um, uh, I think much less is is uh, is known about the uh, about those extremes uh, of environment. Uh, but again, the the those organisms that are occupying those environments did not evolve there. They evolved in warmer climates and more equatorial climates and moved into polar positions over time. So whatever they're doing now would be a, a secondary adaptation. Uh, and I think that's uh, an important feature to keep in mind. That is, no one evolved at the poles. <laughs> you know, or, no organisms would have begun uh, at the poles. They've been migrants. They've, they're immigrants from other parts of the world. Some other questions? 
No questions. <laughs> well, may I have a question that has nothing to do with your topic, if you don't mind? Sure, if, if I can mind. answer. Uh, uh, when uh, we I organize a, a meeting like that, uh, I had two purposes. One is to study the past to learn from the future, because this is clearly one of the and so what is a little complex today? And what you think, and what your experience of the function of an academy, as this one, academy, in respect to the policy maker? And what your mm -hmm. experience in your country about that? Well, Sorry, say, of this question, but I think yeah. it's relevant to organize, uh, to collect uh, some uh, function for the academies, authorized academies. Well, certainly advising uh, a government is essential. In the U.S., this hasn't happened. And but I mean... You, it, you, why, you think? Uh, it depends, Sorry. It, I, it can depend on the administration that's in power. Uh, you know, a few years ago, we had a, an administration that did not, uh, that left many scientific, you know, uh, uh, positions uh, requiring scientific expertise unfilled. Uh, there were denials of large uh, chunks of medicine and science uh, within the administration. Uh, ordinarily, you would have scientific societies being called on for accurate uh, or attempts at accuracy with uh, regard to mm -hmm. uh, information about medicine and science. And so I think that's a, it's very important to have recognized societies that uh, are looked to historically uh, by governments to understand what our policy should be. Another example is we've just, we're still, you know, on the tail end of a medical emergency that has lasted for two years. And uh, uh, how did we get here? And how are we, how have we spent our resources in the past to protect us from uh, disaster? Uh, do we want to put our money into military aircraft? or do we want to put our money into medicine and research? Uh, those are, I, that kind of a conversation is, is not made in the US, for example. The increase in the budget for military spending, the increase is mm -hmm. five times the size of the National Institutes of Health budget. Now we've just come through uh, a biological disaster that has killed huge numbers of individuals and yet we're spending we're spending in such a, uh, a bizarre way on protecting our public so, so there needs to be uh, an influence that says look uh, rethink everything that's gone before let's judge what our liabilities are you don't wipe out anything, but you have to judge wh where, where are your assets needed. And if you have too few assets in a given area, you need to, you need to look to these organizations to have, that, uh, to have that kind of advice. And if you've identified the organizations before the crisis arises, <laughs> then, you, then, then you already know who to ask and who to have confidence in. And, uh, do you think the academies, like this one or other academy? Well, certainly the national, very... yeah, the U.S. National Academy is supposed to be advisory to the government. It was created by Lincoln for that. Uh, Actually, for historically, that you would say, well, for that. Yes. But today yes. is a little bit more complicated. Well, that's because the, you know, that's not because of something the academy has done. It's because you have uh, so much flexibility in the administration. There's in many cases, not an expectation that should be there, which is to say we need to look broadly at how to protect our public. What is the purpose of government? Uh, and who do you consult to get uh, useful information? Yes, thank, thank you very much for this. Yeah. Sorry for 
being explicit and said, but <laughs> okay. for us it's important really. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. something that we need some connection because otherwise what, what we are doing, we have organized very, very nice meetings, okay, and uh, we can learn much for that. But it's not enough, in my opinion. Yes, it can it can be expanded in those in in it in uh, in very important directions. Again, uh, where do you get advice? You can't go out and just uh, randomly look uh, for advice. Uh, what happens if you don't have an advisory structure mm -hmm. is that you just choose whatever advisors tell you what you want to hear. <laughs> and in the U.S., we heard that for several years. Um, so it's... Okay. Uh, Thank you for your uh, comment on that. Uh, so if there are no answers at all, then thank you very much. Some coffee break or...